Okay, morning everyone. Um, I see we're still getting some attendees registering or logging in, but I think we can start. Um, welcome to the Sankot uh, talk uh, today. Um, I must admit these virtual platforms seem to be working quite well. We previously with our breakfast talks, we'd have between 10 and 20 people attending um, at the um, GIB offices. But with this virtual platform, I mean, Nick is in Dubai, but he's able to give the talk to us today. And we have a, a far greater participation, um, probably because it takes less time to actually just log in and be part of the proceedings. Anyway, today's talk is, is being given by Nick. Uh, Nick has given us a few talks previously, um, and we welcome his contribution. Uh, he's basically a mining engineer. Um, and he's been with uh, BASF for, for quite a while. He's based in Dubai. Um, he's, sorry, with Master Builders Construction Chemicals Group in Dubai. He's been involved with uh, mining and shockreting and waterproofing for a long time. And he's presented numerous um, papers at conferences and events around the world. And he was instrumental in putting together the World Tunnel Congress um, in Dubai in 2018. Um, joining us as well is Jason Cooper. Jason has um, just joined um, the Master Builders Construction Chemicals Group. Uh, he's the local representative based in Midrand. So if any of you have any questions or need to meet with uh, Jason, um, we do have his particulars. So I think without much ado, uh, we seem to have about 38 participants at the moment, not counting the, the panelists. But Nick, if I can hand over to you. Thank you very much for giving the talk today. Thanks very much. Okay, excellent. So, um, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about the recent developments in sprayed concrete and waterproofing. And um, I first want to just um, introduce a little bit or remind those that are involved here um, a little bit about Master Builders. Um, obviously we've been around the business and in the market uh, in Southern Africa for a long time, but um, we may have dropped off your radar a little bit and certainly we're a lot more than just sprayed concrete. Um, and hopefully over the next uh, coming years, Jason will be out and about introducing himself and uh, working together with many of you, both on the mines and in the tunneling projects coming up, um, looking at a number of areas of technology that we believe we can support the industry. So um, what I'm gonna look at today is basically, I'm gonna try to give you a very quick overview on what we talk about and demonstrate and train in about five days in our workshops in um, in Switzerland, as you can see here, where we have up to 60 to 70 participants. So 38 is a good number today. Um, but obviously I'm gonna go through it very quickly. And uh, hopefully there'll be some questions. And if at the end, I will leave Jason's contact details. If anybody wants to go into anything in more detail, then just get a hold of him and we'll set something up to um, support you and provide you that details. So to start with, back to basics, I think everybody is familiar with sprayed concrete, but just to recap, it's basically cement, aggregates and water. That's it, it is just concrete. But we put it in place by projecting it pneumatically onto the substrate. Now, spread concrete comes under very various different terms. Some people call it shockcrete, some people call it gunite, some people call it guncrete, some people call it whatever. Um, spread concrete covers all of that, because at the end of the day, it is just concrete. So it covers both wet and dry. And there are, again, within there, also two different generic types of uh, sprayed concrete. 
those without accelerators and those with accelerators. And I've seen a number of very good examples of um, jobs done without accelerators, both in South Africa and a lot in the US. But for pools and architectural features, single-sided formwork, permanent structures. And, but what we're gonna to talk today and what we're focusing on is generally rock support and their accelerators and the chemistry is important. So the dry method is very easy equipment. It's cheap and nasty. If you'll excuse my uh, phrase nasty, it's cheap and appropriate in some places and sometimes. The logistics is very easy and flexible, but it needs to be dry. Um, and that aggregate moisture content means that it's very, very difficult to control the water cement ratios. And the water cement ratio defines the strength, which means that your nozzle man defines the quality of the materials. And at the same time, he will also define the rebound. And in the dry mix method, that tends to be very high. If we're using fibers, which in rock support we want to, you will end up having extremely high levels of rebound, which in turn leads to an extremely high project costs as our volumes go over about 100 cubes, maybe 100 to 200 cubes. Now with the wet mix method, yes, it's more expensive. Um, you spend a little bit more money getting the base mix correct, and we'll look at that. Uh, we'll focus on that in the first half of the presentation but you are able to achieve a quality repeatable concrete mix. And with the uh, developments, we can achieve very high strengths with low water cement ratios and in turn, very good levels of rebound. So your overall volume of material, even though your base mix is higher, the reduction in the volume of material you require and the higher production rates and the use of fibers which stay in the mix, and you'll see a little bit later why that's so important, actually leads to overall lower project costs. So the wet mix is what we're going to be focusing on today. And shotcrete, sprayed concrete, is just concrete. So it's made up of water, cement, and here we define aggregates and sand as two separate things. But at the end of the day, it is just aggregates. We can add a little bit of extras, uh, fibers, microsilica, pozzolans, uh, fly ash, GGBFS. But all of these are basically, um, as we call, cementitious materials. And at the end of all of that, the admixtures, the bit that we supply as a company, is less than 0.3% of that total mix. Now, Normally when I present this, I ask the question, what do people think the most important part of a shotcrete mix is? And we get answers such as the cement, the aggregates, the water cement ratio. But actually it's not. 70% of the mix is aggregates. And by default, although that may be the cheapest component, it is by far and away the most important the quality of the aggregates and the time we spend getting the right aggregates all the way around will provide an improved or otherwise concrete mix. So if I'm able to use the perfect aggregates and the perfect sand, I need to use virtually no, uh, no admixtures. And this is what the perfect uh, grading looks like. So, the organization called FNARC will come back and you'll see that over and over again. And I'm sure that anybody who's been dealing with sprayed concrete in the past in South Africa is familiar with FNARC because back in the late 90s, this was the only organization that really drove the specifications. But they haven't changed. Those specifications, especially for the aggregate, were practical. They came from years and years of experience from those countries, typically Scandinavia, where high production, wet mix concrete of a high quality was done on a regular basis. And these gradings work. If you can find your aggregates and spend the time getting the aggregates between these curves, everything else is easier. Now, 
obviously cement does have an impact and for sprayed concrete for numerous reasons we really want to focus only on type one two and three and another level of detail is which you use where and focusing on 42.5 and 52.5 the better the quality of your cement the better the ability to achieve many of the characteristics that you require from your mix and the local um, specifications for cement apply for spray concrete as well then we come into the admixtures now as we said only 0.3 of that concrete is based on the admixtures however they are the tool by which we can adjust our raw materials to do what we want them to do so again you don't have to use admixtures however experience shows that it is very difficult nigh on impossible to achieve the results that we're looking for without using admixtures and the main one that we start with is the control over both the water reduction i.e the strength of the mix and the rheology how we handle it and the first development here is if you look at the uh, the table here we go from the ligna sulfonates which in the old days used to be uh, master pozolith they moved into the master rear build so when i first arrived in south africa we were supplying master rear build to all the mines if i remember rightly it was master rear build 3610 and then the pa uh, pces came in uh, polycarboxylate acids and uh, east esters sorry um, and that developed into the master glinium where we had excellent water reduction really good water reduction but the rheology that was a little bit more difficult and the developments over the last five to ten years the improvements in the base concrete mix has been developed through products such as master ease which gives us not only good water reduction but also excellent rheology retention so now this is a little bit of a confusing uh, table but i want you to just focus on those uh, those arrows which are darker and pointing straight up because those are the ones which have the biggest impact on the characteristics of the concrete and really those are the ones that we're focusing on to provide us with high quality durable permanent concrete for the future another important admixture which isn't new but it's always worth remembering because especially as we get into longer tunnels and i'm thinking lesotho um, tunnels in remote locations and those ro remote locations may be the underground logistics as well as the surface logistics we need to have the flexibility and by flexibility what we're focusing on is to have everything we do with sprayed concrete related to rock support is about applying the concrete at the right time now if i drill and blast my face and i have to wait for a couple of hours for my concrete to arrive because i didn't want to batch it until i was ready for it because i've only got one to two hours in the truck then i'm delaying my support process which delays my re-entry time which delays starting the drilling and blasting for the next round so we're always focusing on having the concrete waiting for the face rather than the face waiting for the concrete and the hydration control admixtures enables us to do that from a rheology point of view now we're looking at actually achieving the mix but also being able to test that so it's repeatable so that at the batch plant we can achieve and check and make sure we're getting the right thing and this is basic concrete technology there's nothing fancy about this um, typically the slump test is used in most ready mix and batch plants however personally i prefer the flow table test and just looking at this little video here hopefully it plays okay for you all 
Um, this is the slump table test because this tells me a lot more about the concrete than the slump test. If you look at this mix that you can see here, it's moving out in a perfect circle. Around the edge of that circle, there's no bleed, there's no segregation, there's no lumps in the middle. If I've got fibers in my mix, I can see very clearly whether there's any balls of fibers coming out and being displayed. So what I'm looking for is a mix that goes absolutely flat, goes to a width of between 550 and 650 millimeters, and provides me with an almost matte finish on the top. There's no bleed, there's no bubbles. It's, you get a very good indication of the quality as well as the actual number of the spread. So that's looking at the base concrete and those developments have um, actually accelerated over the last 20 to 25 years. The change as the industry woke up and started to move to wet mix, uh, I started my life in tunnels in the UK, um, Terminal 5 uh, baggage tunnel was all sprayed using dry mix. And that was about 30 years ago now. So the change has come relatively quickly. And now that rate of change has accelerated even more. And as we see there, the reduction in the water cement ratios, the improvement of the rheology, looking at higher production rates, the use of fibers, and coming down to single shell systems, which in turn leads to the holy grail of sprayed concrete, which is permanent, sustainable sprayed composite structures. And we'll look at that a wee bit later. But first, I just want to highlight the benefits and the requirement for another component in this system, not necessarily changes, although developments are underway with this technology all the time, but is the use of fibers. And you see from that picture down on the bottom right hand side um, that if you try to spray over mesh, you start building voids behind it, it's very difficult to do. Anybody who sprayed at night or in low light in a tunnel will see the, uh, the rebound of aggregates coming off the mesh sparking up. And we don't need that. Typically in hard rock, we want to be able to follow the substrate and um, we don't want to overuse the concrete. Again, it's all about minimizing rebound and focusing on reducing the total project costs. Um, and while mesh in theory may be cheap to cover a specified area, in practice, as ground moves, as uh, rock relaxes, um, as it's not placed exactly right, you also need to have uh, re redoing of it. And your bolting pattern is defined by the mesh, not by the rock support that you require. Now, of course, with fibers, it's important that we quantify what we're getting. And although this is not so common in South Africa, I believe it is available on a number of sites. Um, typically, the uh, square panels were used a lot, but the ASTM C1550 is very easy and appropriate, especially from a quality control on site point of view, because you just need to spray the round panel. You don't need to do any cutting and you get a much more repeatable result. Now, these results can also be related directly to that FNARC square panel and the, the results or the definition of the concrete that is used in uh, the European norms. Now, typically, I would guess the uh, although it's an ASTM standard, uh, that's only because the European norms were already full up um, and the inventor of the system or the, the process took it to the States and said, here, can you put a, uh, a test to this one? So the test work has been done to establish the relation between the two and a 2.5 factor has been established. 
So where you need a specification of E700 from the energy absorption class, that is 280 joules on the round panel test. And that's defined by the fibers. Now, this is where the continuous development is ongoing. And it's not something that I can give you um, just a uh, defined recent development because this is ongoing all the time. This doesn't stop. The fiber suppliers around the world are aggressively working against each other together uh, with the concrete um, matrix suppliers to find the optimum performance. And that opt optimum performance is defined by a very fine balance between the fibers pulling out and the fibers rupturing. And it's a, uh, a very close interaction between the concrete and the fibers. If your, your fibers are too high tensile and the low bond, then they just pull out of the concrete, doesn't do anything for them. If the fibers are too weak, but your concrete is too strong, then you just get a brittle rupture and it just cracks and there's no fibers left across that crack width, which is when they start doing their work. So what we're always looking for is to optimize the type and number of fibers and the concrete matrix that bonds them together. And of course, the concrete matrix develops in strength over time. So it also matters how quick that strength development is in our rock support uh, definition and at what time we're testing to achieve the performance criteria that we're defining our concrete by. And just to have a quick look and remind ourselves of what happens if we don't put fibers in a concrete. Well, if we don't put fibers in a concrete, you get that blue line, plain concrete, at about uh, less than half a millimeter vertical displacement on a beam. It's gone, it's finished, it's cracked. And there is no more load being taken by the structure, by the matrix. No more resistance to the load. If we look at the small deflections, less than one and a half millimeters, then typically at the moment, and developments are always underway, a steel fiber looks to be more attractive. But as we develop higher displacements and typically in hard rock, we have bigger displacements rather than uh, softer, uh, weaker ground. You can see that the polypropylene fiber actually becomes far better and the total energy absorbed, so back to that round panel joule number, is much higher at a level of deflection than the, um, the steel fibers. So <coughs> certainly focusing in South Africa, mining applications with deformation, uh, with higher deformations with load at depth, your load bearing capacity is higher and that leads to much safer mixes. Now, some of the work that we're doing within our organization is benchmarking the available fibers out there and uh, looking at all the different characteristics of what makes the performance work for rock support and we're doing tests on single fibers on beam tests on energy absorption tests on the round panels and then looking at the real theory like fiber dimensions the characteristics and um, relating those to the overall matrix. Now, that is ongoing. Uh, one point I just want to highlight here is that whatever type of fibers we use, the number of fibers across the crack, i.e. the number of fibers in the matrix, not rebounded, is the defining factor to the performance of the material, whatever fiber you're using. So we have seen that and obviously then the focus is very much more on getting the fibers in the mix on the wall than just what fiber we're using because we waste more money by having rebounder fibers 
than we do on having a different type of fiber. So there's your concrete. That's the basic concrete mix. And typically this would be used for your temporary support in a civil engineering structure. So we're now switching a little bit to putting the Sancot hat on rather than the SIMM. And here we now get into talking about creating structures using spread concrete. Now, in the past, the big challenge has been waterproofing. How do we waterproof a tunnel or cavern or structure underground? Because as soon as you go underground, there's going to be water somewhere. And as uh, Ron mentioned, I'm based in Dubai. You'd think that in the middle of the desert, there'd never be any water. I can assure you that in the mountains, it rains maybe two ice or three times a year. The ground is so fractured that even in an incredibly arid environment, water works its way into tunnels because it flows through the rock so quickly. It comes to rest on the back of the structure and it works its way in. So if there was no waterproofing, you would have a big issue. So in the past, what's happened is that we've used our fiber reinforced concrete for the temporary structure. We've then placed a geotextile uh, fleece upon which we place a PVC sheet membrane. We try to double weld the joints as much as possible. And then we place over the top of this, and it's important, this is now a slip layer. We place over the top of this a permanent support design which is designed to take the full loads both of the the rock and the hydrostatic pressure so it works completely independently from the primary temporary spread concrete that we've applied even though that temporary support had to be designed to withstand the same uh mixes but just temporary uh, sorry the same forces but just temporarily now what i'm going to introduce you now is an alternative approach and that is utilizing the primary spread concrete as part of the permanent structure and by bonding that together with the final spread concrete layer we actually achieve the same support regime with a much thinner layer. Now for that to work, we need to place the waterproofing somehow in the middle of that layer of concrete. And to make that work properly, that waterproofing needs to bond to both sides. And to meet that demand, we've come up with a product called Master Seal 345, which is a double bonded system. So let's just go back a step. If we're doing loose laid waterproofing, and this is the traditional methodology that has been used all over the world many, many times in many areas uh, for decades. Uh, I think that uh, my colleagues in the industry who come with the yellow stuff uh, can go back 60 to 80 years references in some of the Alpine tunnels. Now, this is not to say that the loose laid system with the drained detail, which you can see on the right hand side there, cannot be used or should not be used in certain environments. However, it doesn't need to be used in all. And you can see that you need quite a heavy piece of reinf uh, not reinforcing, sorry, that you need a heavy um, scaffolding arrangement to place the, uh, the waterproofing on the rock. And this offers a drain solution so the water will flow freely through the geotextile layer all around behind that uh, waterproofing membrane and down into the base now if we've got a nice simple structure like that it's easy to do we can do all manual uh, sorry all mechanical welding with the machines and all the rest of it however not all tunnel structures are like that and you can see here some cross passages done on um, the London Underground uh, on the Crossrail project, where a more realistic 
application is coming. And the leaks never happen on the easy bits. Leaks only ever happen on the tricky bits. And as soon as we have a difficult structure like this, you can imagine how many welds we've got and how much waste of material there is around the edges. And then we're placing the reinforcing and the concrete structure on the inside of that. We've got risks that we're going to get uh, punctures in that um, PVC sheet membrane. And we're not going to be able to see them because we've already got all that reinforcing over the top. So as soon as we get into these tricky, very uh, variable shapes, awkward small sections, etc., it becomes very much more difficult. Whereas with a spray, apply, a spray applied waterproofing membrane, you can apply that whole section, that whole detail in one go. The material can be sprayed over your starter bars and will waterproof those joints as well which of course you could never do with a PVC sheet membrane. And we then bond the second layer onto it. In practice, we can do either a one coat or a two coat uh, approach, depending on what the substrate is like. If it's very rough, we might need two coats. If it's a very well sprayed, smooth layer, then we can get away with one coat with the appropriate quality control. Now a little bit of the chemistry behind it, because this is where the real developments are in the use of sprayed linings. The 345 is a durable polymer. Obviously it's spray applied and designed to provide you with the optimum watertight lining with a minimum of maintenance costs. And this we will come back to. And at the same time, create this option for developing in the design module uh, the composite shell lining or CSL. We'll see that again. So remember CSL as a day. The polymer itself is an EVA, which is an abbreviation of ethylene vinyl acetate. Now that same material is used in um, solar panels to protect the solar cells against um, wear and tear, impact, sun, what have you. So it's a very, very durable, hard wearing material. It's resistant to corrosion. And an important part is that it's plasticizer free. Typically, PVCs have a plasticizer in there to enable them to be manipulated and handled. And that plasticizer leaches out over time. And anybody who's left their garden chairs out for a couple of years, you see in the picture there on the right hand side, and then had that um, large relative turn up for the bri and sat down and the chairs disappear. So this material is plasticizer free. It doesn't degrade over time. And it's also a component to a product which we're all very familiar with. and. Um, used is uh, chewing gum, bubble gum. So from an application point of view, that polymer is mixed as a collide into an emulsion with a dispersion. And that means that the materials have a, a soap there, which when you add the, the water, it enables these to activate the soap and that as you spray it onto the surface, create that this um, paste on the surface. Now that paste by a process of water evaporation um, cures and creates the film formation without the water in there. Now it actually doesn't matter. It's very flexible about how much water you place in there because it just takes a little bit longer to evaporate, but it still evaporates down to the optimum film formation, as you can see on the right hand side. Now, another useful thing with these materials um, is that uh, it basically creates a material that allows the concrete underneath it to breathe. So you can apply it very early on in the process, which gives you great flexibility in production. And it works like a Gore-Tex. 
So it stops the water visibly coming through, which is what we want. It stops the water being able to attack any of the reinforcement. But at the same time, it allows the water vapor through, which allows the concrete to breathe and cure completely. Now, obviously, we've done a lot of tests on this. Uh, it's not something we've just thought up in the lab and then introduced in the market. This product's actually been around for nearly 20 years already. But it's only with certain other aspects that it's become uh, able to be used more often. So we did a, a wee test where we exerted um, a pressure onto the uh, concrete through a hole and um, we exerted that pressure at um, two millimeters up to 20 bar. So with a bond of 1.2 MPA, it was able to withstand that 20 bar for 12 months, obviously trying to provide an accelerated um, weathering and extreme environment. Typically, we would uh, promote um, and achieve crack bridging of two and a half millimeters, which will depend on the thickness, just from a physical point of view. If you spray at two millimeters, you're gonna get two millimeters crack bridging. If you spray it at three millimeters, you'll get just under three millimeters crack bridging. And there's no water migration. That bond means that there's no water that can travel along the interface between the two or three layers of material which in turn means that it works monolithically as a, um, a structure. So again, we've done tests in compression, we've done tests in uh, expansion for the crack bridging, and we've tested on the bond. So there's a wee picture of the bond here, and you can have a look at the test being actually carried out and just see the loads building on this cord sample where the master seal is in the middle. And for those of the, you can see, hopefully you can see it okay, is you can see the load building up and it should be building up to, if I remember rightly, about 1.6 MPA on this particular sample. And boom. Okay, and that's a failure. So good bond to both sides of the, uh, the substrate and uh, no failure within the material. So the important thing is obviously those uh, interfaces. So looking at the, uh, the double bonded uh, approach in practice in the field, what does it mean? Well, it means that the, uh, the economics, we have a regulating layer in there uh, to minimize the thickness of the membrane. Again, looking for around three millimeters as an optimum. Primary lining is primary permanent. We then have the double bonded sprayed membrane with a secondary concrete lining on the inside of it. Just to have a look at the, the bonding, um, it's identical whether it be for sprayed or cast concrete, because the, uh, the bonding is both chemical and physical. So right down to the microstructures, as you can see here, the material um, links together with the concrete or smoothing layer applied onto the concrete. And on the other side, so there's a chemical and um, mechanical bond between the two. Now, from a water point of view, so this is why we're using this, not just for the mechanicals, but all from the water point of view, if we use the unbonded system. Now, remember we said that the, these are typically used as drained structures, which means that we let, or we're assuming we're gonna have some water coming through our, from the rock, our temporary spray concrete lining, and that will go into the geotextile and that geotextile will allow the water to, to migrate anywhere behind the PVC sheet membrane. Now, as the guys are putting the reinforcing on or somebody just walked past or you're using steel fibers, you may end up with a small leak in the PVC sheet membrane. 
Now, on the other side of that sheet membrane, you don't have a bond to the concrete either. You may have some uh, potential for migration on the other side. And that means that the water then fills up the entire void between the cast concrete and the uh, PVC sheet membrane and basically searches for any defect such as a cold joint or even a planned construction joint between the um, or within the concrete, the cast concrete. And you'll see these layers, uh, these drips, these leaks in many, many PVC sheet lined tunnels. Now the concept behind the spray applied is that yes, you still got the same concrete, sprayed concrete lining initially, but that sprayed concrete lining is permanent within the design, not temporary. And if the water comes through there and it reaches the, um, the membrane, then it's only if the membrane is damaged at that point that the water can get through the membrane. But once it's through that membrane, there's no uh, migration on the other side either. So it's only if there is a leak through the permanent secondary lining that that leak will actually come out into the tunnels. And the beauty there is that we're able to identify exactly where that weak point is and not only repair it on the intrados of the tunnel, but through basic injection techniques, we're able to chase that leak all the way back through the primary concrete lining and back into the rock and seal the leak very, very easily. And effectively with a couple of liters, maybe not even a liter of um, low viscosity acrylic resins. Now this technology has been uh, adopted in a number of areas around the world. It's well accepted by the global tunneling industry. Documents have been put together by ITEC for the ITA, and those documents are available for you to download through the committee's page on the ITA website. This is actually a little bit of an old slide. The ITA website's improved since then, but please go to the ITEC page. Uh, that's the committee of which I'm a member, and look at the documents there. There's a number of documents there, and the latest one is actually on permanent sprayed concrete to link together with the use of spray applied waterproof membranes because that's also important and this is where we start coming into the application and job references so i want to give you one from uh, a few years back nearly to over 10 years now is a uh, two kilometer tunnel in the uk um, it's around the water table so it wasn't heavily underwater and they but it was an environmentally sensitive area and the initial design was 200 mil primary uh, lining um, no steel elements rock bolts um, and uh, fibers were utilized and that's what it looks like now within that uh, process we introduced the master seal 345 concept and the process they followed was to had a look at it through a value engineering workshop and they quantified the benefits and it looked good obviously at the end of the day somebody decided that they could save some money on this so they went through the process site trials and into construction and they developed two complete systems uh solutions i should say that went forward for discussion and evaluation. The traditional PVC sheet membrane system versus the spray applied membrane. And the one that they eventually went for was the spray applied membrane because they identified some savings. And you'll notice here, this is important. The savings are on the extra DOS of the tunnel. The inner lining is still the same dimensions. That means you save not only in volume of concrete, but you also save in the volume of excavation. And by reducing the excavation, you speed everything up. And that can amount to a couple of trucks about uh, a um, a couple of trucks a um, a cycle. So this was the basic uh, design with cast in situ sidewalls for aesthetics and safety in the road tunnel. 
but the materials cost actually that were identified on this for materials costs not necessarily time accounted to over 1.5 million and obviously that's well over 30 30 million rands in real money so that's one reference now we're coming into the moving into the mainstream how do we make this of interest to the wider industry well for those of you that subscribe to tunnels and tunneling i highly recommend it if you're in the tunneling industry have a look at uh, last month this month's um, articles and you'll see there a very good article written by dr alan thomas on sprayed concrete and here we're focused on sprayed concrete as part of a sustainable solution but there's two critical items in this now alan doesn't go into this in too much detail he focuses on the potential of using a composite system so you can see in the table in the middle or the, sorry the, the diagram in the middle there that we're incorporating a permanent primary with a bonded membrane and a secondary layer over the top of it to create a thinner concrete reduce the volume of concrete you make the structure more sustainable design is critical to that being accepted on a wider stage but at the same time it's also vital that we have the competence of the operators to be able to achieve that so from a design point of view soft ground typically has much thicker layers um, your sprayed concrete is stiffer than the ground so your structure and uh, calculations relate to that so you you need to have something that is a very stiff uh, structure and uh, thicker layers lattice girders mesh in between and often fibers as well primary up against which the the mesh is placed so very expensive mix um, and a very stiff layer now hard rock is to a certain extent much more easy and lends itself to the technology we're talking about much easier the rock itself can support with a little bit of help so what we're trying to do is we're trying to help the rock support so rock support rather than a structural lining and uh, fibers are ideal for this and um, typically we will design utilizing an energy absorption methodology and one way of doing that is using the Q system and you'll notice at the bottom of this particular table which is obviously a whole book worth of information jammed into one uh, graph is that the E numbers down at the bottom indicate the performance of the spray concrete for the various ground conditions evaluated from the geography geology back to the concrete an e700 or 280 joules from the round panel test is the ideal performance um, and covers most situations at various varying thicknesses and that enables us to develop and create these permanent spread concrete linings can be used for metro stations can be used for roads can be used for metro running tunnels the requirements are the same and the design methodology is in there for the permanent linings but what is more difficult is this composite lining and here we've had to go and do a little bit of research so first of all we know that the composite shell lining um, is it's a relatively simple structure but the concept is difficult to get over so to actually get into the designers and to uh, help them understand how this works and to enable them to then be able to put that into the data and the tools used for design took a little bit longer so the concept as we say is the interaction between three three layers one stiff one flexible the next one stiff and we know that there is 
load sharing capability between them. And this is what we're looking to try to define because at the end of the day, we're trying to identify and quantify this thickness reduction. So we did some work with uh, Arup, uh, a lot of work with Arup. They did a huge amount of testing to define and model or calibrate the model. Now, uh, Gerard, I know you were asking yesterday the tools that are being used. In this case, they used LS Dyna as the, the modeling tool. And they, by a process of evaluation on notched beams and shear tests on cores, we established the data to input into the model to create the, um, uh, the results. So this is some of the result, the, the data. Um, and you can see that the modeling from LS Dyna, once those characteristics have been put in, matched very closely to the actual results that were coming from things like the panel, uh, panel tests. So this has then been able to create a, um, the modeling in 3D. And then they utilized what's known as the laminate beam theory to develop the equivalent uh, support regime from a typical temporary slip layer cast in situ to a composite shell lining with the two materials together. So here we're able to, through an evaluation of the the thickness from the design initially and relating it back to the composite shell lining, we can evaluate the savings that are available. Now we have a tool available for this. This is something that we would need to get into. It's another hour and a half, maybe longer weeks discussion on the appropriateness and uh, applicability. But in this case, we can just show you one very simple example where a reduction of over 3,000 cubic meters of concrete leading to a 9% reduction on CO2 equivalent and a 21% reduction in concrete consumption. That's just very, very simple exercise. We've developed a handbook that is available for designers. Speak to us afterwards. We will make this available to you. Um, that can be utilized and will guide you through that process. That's then the material side of things. Obviously, we now need to make sure that this is applied in practice on the job site in the appropriate way. So we need to have the right equipment. Unfortunately, we as an organization do not supply the equipment anymore. So we work with all the equipment suppliers to try to achieve the right materials for you. On the material side, when we're applying it, now comes in the accelerators. This is critical on the application more than the design and the base material. So we've got various different inputs on the, um, uh, the appropriateness of the uh, performance on the materials. We would recommend and promote the alkali-free accelerators. In the old days, silicates and illuminates were used, but there's a huge number of uh, drawbacks to those. Um, and from a two very big ones, one is health and safety, but also the final strengths. So the use of those materials for permanent works just doesn't work. And in fact, they're banned in a number of countries. But there are a huge range of alkali free. The one that probably most familiar with is SA160. It's not the only product that we have, but it's a very robust and uh, a usable material all over the world. And you can see in those pictures there, the increase in ettringite formulation without accelerators and with accelerators within a 10 minute period. And that enables us to build up really thick layers if we needed to, although recommended, it's not, uh, not, not recommended to build up those sort of thick layers. So we need to be able to establish what, what's that doing? So we need to test those early age strengths. This is very important in our process to create a permanent CSL lining. 
Early age strength is also important because that enables us to also identify um, how strong my concrete is going to be over time, how durable is it going to be, and these different types of tests are done at different stages in the strength development. And we define strength development at the earlier stages utilizing um, what's known as the J curves. And these curves were developed initially by Austria and then incorporated into the European guidelines EN 14487. And as you can see from the yellow, green and red uh, highlighted areas, the different performances relate to different requirements on a job site. Now, in hard rock tunneling and hard rock mining, one of the critical areas there is this re-entry time. And the re-entry time isn't just that the concrete has reached a strength strong enough to start to help with the rock support, but it's also indicating that it's reached a strength that is able to hold itself onto the substrate and not drop off because drop off is just as dangerous as um, the rock failing. And drop off comes through typically overspraying thicknesses through leading or from the operator's skill levels. Now, here is where we get into training because you wouldn't let your operators drive a truck without having a license yet we let the operators define the rock support in our tunnels and mines without a license so it's very important that we have certified and qualified nozzle men and this little spraying example of the round panels where you can see that the layers on those panels are very flat very smooth and exactly to the standards, which is 75 mil plus minus, sorry, minus five plus 15. Those panels be, will be around 85 millimeters. I know from experience and from testing and from training this particular nozzle man that he is very accurate with spraying those panels. And that's an excellent way of defining how, our, how good our nozzle man is on site in practice. But how do I get him to that level? Now, the best way of training an operator is through virtual reality. Now, this is something that's coming in. It's something that can be done almost remotely in today's situations. And it's being incorporated on many big job sites and uh, governments around the world. For example, Swedish national standards now define it. FNARC has a standard and projects in places like Australia. Uh, on the West Connects, every operator had to go through a test on the simulator. So these um, simulator tests actually utilize the exact equipment. So whatever you're using on the different sites, the simulator can operate with those. So you can see here they're using the old Epiroc Mako um, remote controls. and that's the, the equipment that they're training with. So I'm now going to just run you through the latest developments on the VR shotcrete, which incorporate also some discussion on the concrete strength development, because that is what we're trying to achieve. Now, the, oops, stopped it just a little bit late. There are a number of different versions available. So the limited version is one which we put together for somebody who just wants to try it out and see whether it works for them. The FNARC C2, so FNARC developed the specification. They then moved into training. Initially, they trained the, the testers, so the nozzle man assessors, um, of which myself and my team are all qualified. But then they went on to go to FNARC C2. C2 is a certification. It's the second uh, step in the process driven by FNARC, whereby a shotcrete nozzle man assessor provides some 
theory training to go with the simulator training. And then you've got ESCOP, which is a, an in-house um, site-specific, oh, apologies. Let's go through the video again. My apologies, I've got to remember to stop the, the video. Okay. So the three different options here, you select your user, you select your equipment, as you can see all the different types of equipment that is available. And in this case, we're looking at practice mode. And within the practice mode, we have a certain number of variables that are defined. We're trying to achieve 50 millimeters sprayed on the, the thing. Now here you can see the J curves and the, varia, the, the factors that will affect that. The different type of base concrete, the different type of cement, the water cement ratio, the temperature, the type of accelerator you're using, and the type of uh, the dosage of that accelerator. So as those vary in this video, you'll see the change the uh, plasticizer change. We will go through, and you will see the actual line of the performance of the materials varying according to how you change it so as the accelerator dosage goes up we use a different accelerator okay dosage goes down different type of accelerator has a different effect over different times with the concrete so we can play around with these low temperature high temperature whatever and in time as we go through it you'll see the various things so lower water cement ratio also reduces the performance lower water cement ratio improves it so just looking at the different variables that we have here and you can see here that we're reaching that one mpa with this one at about two hours so now looking at this in practice how does this work well this is what it looks like when you're spraying with the simulator and the operator here is using the boom nicely very systematically back and forth very good control over thickness and um, good angle good distance very low rebound and what have you and we can see that if you look on the left hand side here you can see 1.5 to 2 meters is the distance we're looking for. We're getting a 95% of that material sticking to the rock. Okay, angle as close to 90 degrees as possible, working at 12 cubic meters an hour with a 6% dosage of accelerator. Now, as we move on, of course, in reality, once we've sprayed overhead like this, we then don't want to go underneath it until it is safe and we define one mpa as when it's safe and what we can do now using something that they've developed as time travel is we can evaluate that concrete over time so you can see um, we've got we can vary the re-entry strength okay that we've got the current time growing here we can look at it at different times, but through the time travel function, we can also jump ahead. And you can see the concrete curing and the strength development building up as the colors change. Okay, so now we're starting to get that color improving and we can vary again, the different mixes, the different types of accelerator, and see at a certain time the impact that has on the concrete strength development and this is important when we start developing the training for not just the operators but also the supervisors and the designer and the managers in charge of the job site so as that uh, concrete develops its strength we want to or we can vary the different mixes, evaluate what impact that will have at different times, and we can then jump forwards. 
And as we jump forwards, we can then say, okay, at three hours, we can then go back in, put a second layer on, if depending on the thickness that I need to apply into my uh, job site, based on the ground conditions, and have a look at how that has an impact. Again, now it's back to yellow, and the, um, the safety of being able to go underneath it changes. I get to six hours and it's ready to go and I can go back underneath it. So that's the concept in the training. It's also a good visual of the, um, uh, what our partner Edvir is doing for training. And it really is, it's 3D, you're wearing goggles and you are totally immersed in that, that uh, process. Now this is, um, uh, feedback from a trial or sorry a test um, not a test a training that was done in uh, in Europe four nozzle operators all experienced all worked on shock creep machines before at the start of the test the rebound levels were between 15 and 40 percent that's experienced nozzle men so over the course of the test, the trial, sorry, the training, they sprayed nearly 210 cubic meters of concrete between them. Can you imagine paying for 200 and plus cubic meters of concrete just to train your operators? Well, that cost on its own is about 300,000 rand. And then if you've got a typical mine, a uh, typical job site or mine spraying 5,000 cubic, uh, cubic meters a year, with that average improvement of rebound from the start to the finish, that could lead to a saving of over 2.8 million rand per year. Now, if you could achieve that saving, how much would you pay for the training? I'll leave that out there as a question to come back from the industry and these trainings have been done all over the world now with certification and that's a critical part of that so i'm going to take you through two job references at the end here of two situations and examples of um, utilizing these composite shell linings so the first one is on crossrail here the composite shell lining was embraced completely, but not with eyes wide shut, but with the knowledge and awareness that training was a vital part of the process at all levels within the management of that system, from the applicator, the operator at the nozzle, the guy that needs to be licensed and certified, but also education and awareness for the supervisors and the engineers both designing and constructing that so on the crossrail they developed their own training and underground academy called tuka which actually bought i think between four and six of these um, virtual reality training tools to enable them to teach the operators because they were using permanent spread concrete and spray applied waterproof linings. So as a square meterage, the um, square meters of spray applied waterproof membrane on the jobs was, I should actually have done a calculation beforehand, but well over 200,000 square meters of what in the end of the day is composite shell lining. But not just composite shell lining for the sake of doing it. Where appropriate, they also incorporated and utilized a um a dual system where we used a loose lay pvc sheet membrane on the invert which is trafficked and is easy to apply and the concrete sits on top of it so you lay and cast your invert and then you spray the side walls and the crown and here's some jobs again where they've already cast the invert either on a sprayed or pvc sheet membrane and you can see in all of these cases the difficult shapes that in the spraying over the starter bars for the final lining 
spraying around corners for cross passages and the like. Uh, entry caverns, varying shaped structures, very, very easily done using the master seal. So huge volumes done in London very successfully. The other example is one that's on Metro Prague. And here the client wasn't quite so uh, fully bought into the concept. So they had three main stations to excavate and they decided to go with two of the stations, a um, PVC sheet membrane. And on the final station, which was a bit more difficult, as you can say, the three stage excavation here, it was more complicated. So the guys went, well, we'll do that with spray applied. So spray applied in some quite tricky areas, but still able to do it around the corners, around the edges in those difficult uh, situations. But the results, what actually happened? Well, on those stations where they used the PV sheet membrane, for one reason or another, they had some challenges. And the, from BSF, master builders, we were called in to work together with the uh, owner to seal those leaks. So we know exactly how much it's cost to repair. We didn't supply the PVC sheet membrane, but we were asked him to repair it. So when we look at the costs of the square meter rate, you can see that the master seal was more expensive than both sites with the PVC sheet membrane. Not a lot, just a little bit, maybe what, five, 10%. But after the repair works, and I highlight that on some of those sites, the repair works are still ongoing. We're very happy about it because we are now making, oh, they've made what, 35,000, 50,000 euros, uh, sorry, yes, um, costs of um, the injection works, acrylic polyurethane injection, water stopping and repairing, even the compartmental, a uh, compartmentalized PVC sheet membranes. So real clear indication of what can happen. So in conclusion, permanent sustainable sprayed linings are realistically possible in all regions, regardless of experience or skills. The material developments and uh, improvements over the years are there to enable that to happen. Design methodologies are there, both for hard rock and soft ground, but training is essential. And I would go one step further, training and qualification is essential. And that virtual training has proved time and time again to be not only cost effective, but actually saves your project, your site, your mine, money over a very, very short period of time. So if you need any more information, you want to do site trials, workshops, you would like invitations to our um, training in Switzerland, site demonstrations, brochures, submittals, product developments, education, or the virtual reality training, please contact Jason and together with our global team, we will set those up and look to support and develop your project in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of information and uh, a nice clear talk. And I've got some comments here uh, complimenting you on your presentation. We have about 10 more minutes before the webinar will actually come to an end. Perfect. There are a few questions. We can just run through them quickly. Um, the first one is the maximum size of aggregate that can be used in shockrete. Okay. Um, right. I've sprayed anything up to 16 millimeters on different job sites. Um, but I can tell you from practical, painful experience, anything over 10 millimeters will end up in rebound. So the recommended maximum aggregate size is um, 
passing a 10 millimeter uh, sieve on your um, back, uh, your um, uh, aggregate plant. So simple answer, 10 millimeters is recommended. If you're doing spray applied waterproof membrane, then we would also recommend that within the buildup of your primary permanent layer, you also incorporate like a smoothing layer where you would be using a four or five millimeter aggregate to reduce the consumption of the spray applied waterproof membrane. Okay, no, great. And then the EVA, what is the curing time of the EVA? Okay, it will depend on a number of environmental factors, of course. Um, we define whether or not it's cured ready for overspraying or overcasting through the um, shore hardness. So final shore hardness is about 80. Cured sufficiently to, to spray over is 40. And that will usually be achieved in typical uh, applications in about 12 hours. So, you know, you can have a very flexible um, process, 12 to 24 hours, no problem. But at the same time, it can also be left for several months without detrimental effect before you overspray. Okay. which perhaps I can answer that question further down. That can even work outside um, and the material is UV resistant and you, where you would use it on drinking water facilities, um, you'd need to define whether or not you can accept just plain concrete in those drinking water facilities because it's not designed to waterproof from the inside out but rather the outside in. Okay, great. And then you said that the master seal 345 should be applied to primary concrete at an early stage to bond. And the question is how early? Um, no, it doesn't need to be uh, at an early stage. If I said that, I apologize. That was obviously me getting carried away. It needs to be applied to the primary concrete, um, but it can be applied at any age. So it's also been used very, very effectively in uh, refurbishment jobs, even on something like a brick line tunnel. Um, so um, we did a major refurbishment job on a project in Lebanon where the concrete was 20 years old. We scabbled the, the surface or hydro milled the surface back 10 to 15 millimeters and then sprayed the master seal over that and an inner concrete lining and it's worked perfectly so um but the question's still valid how early it can be as early as the concrete will take it so the concrete because of the gore-tex style waterproofing effect the concrete can still breathe because the concrete can still breathe the concrete can still cure and gain its full strength so that early could be hours, but production and access and what have you, typically it's the next shift is the quickest. Okay. And then next question is the pros and cons of master seal versus crystalline waterproofing slurries. Okay. Um, slurries or admixtures, um, because often the, the waterproofing uh, or the, the um, the crystalline waterproofing is something that's also incorporated in the concrete. Uh, that's being done now because the industry is starting to look at the whole structure of the concrete and the waterproofing as being part of the watertight system, not just assigning that to one, two to three millimeter section in the middle. If you've got perfectly watertight concrete on the outside, you've got belt and braces. So the technology is valid as part of the overall system. The pros and cons typically comes in crack bridging. Um, the crystalline waterproofing is a reactive from a crack bridging point of view. In theory, they will fill very, very minor cracks and seal them, but only if there's live water. 
they won't stop that water from getting there in the first place. So it needs to be evaluated on a holistic basis. And um, typically the crystalline waterproof slurries is a reactive post applied um, repair methodology. Okay. And then uh, a question here is, can it be applied to wet primary shock relay or running water? I take it the question no. is, what's seeping? <laughs> what's this um, rock? And then can it yeah, be not, again, very good question. Um, very good question and very valid. And that's something that absolutely needs to be dealt with on a case by case basis. If I have got running water, um, and maybe we need to look at doing the injection, um, the injection uh, discussion again, is before, if I'm expecting running water, I will know it before I drill and blast my excavation, assuming that it's rock. If I've got water in the ground, then the best way of dealing with it is by pre-injection. So sealing the water before I even excavate it. If I still have water coming in, after I've exposed the fresh rock surface, then the methodology that I would recommend as part of a CSL lining is thin layer of shotcrete with a high dosage of accelerator for early age strength, but thin, 25 mil over the substrate. Identify the areas, that, so that's deliberately thin because we don't want to try to stop any water coming in. We just want to channel it to that those points where it's easiest for it to come in i.e the biggest void uh, biggest water paths so we identify those places where the water comes in and we install drains or uh, like channel drains down the concrete or actual drains pipes into the uh, the excavation and then spray your permanent layer of shotcrete around that. You can spray your master seal over that dry substrate because I've channeled the water through pipes. Once I have a waterproofed structure, I can then go back in at those drain points and inject to control the water prior to putting the final lining up. So it's a step-by-step -step approach. If it's just small seepage, then you would take it on a smaller level and you just drill little 10 millimeter holes where it's seeping and um, put in little jet packers or you know the little drive-in packers allow the water to drain at those points um, and again either channel drains or uh, low viscosity acrylic injection Okay, so mainly uh, control the water as much as you can before you put on your... Absolutely, um, yes. Uh, but it's a, it's a total approach in the excavation cycle, not just at the very end when I'm doing the waterproofing. Sure. And then combining two questions here is, um, can it be used above ground and is it UV resistant? Uh, yes, it is UV resistant. But um, from the point of view of a delay in application of the final lining, rather than as a final waterproofing structure. So again, relating that to the, the water retaining structures, the potable water retaining structures, it's something that would be most likely incorporated into the concrete structure for that. But the actual material in contact with water and in turn in contact with daylight over a longer period of time is more likely, and be, we, we would certainly recommend to be a purpose design, say, for example, uh, methyl acrylate or polyurea silicate waterproofing membrane that works in the positive way, i.e., the water's pushing against the membrane into the concrete structure. This is designed to be working in a sandwich against negative water pressure where the water is trying to push it off the primary concrete lining 
because the water is coming from the ground outwards. Okay. And then, yes, someone who actually got up at four o'clock this morning, his time, to listen to this. <laughs> Excellent PowerPoint. Oh. Thanks for it. Um, it's worth getting up at 4 a.m. But he also has a question. He says, what about the junction of the PVC to MCL345? Is there a special treatment? And what about the overlapping and bonding? Um, yes. So we've established that the bond between the master seal and the PVC membranes is sufficient to also work as part of the prevent that migration of water past that joint. Because of course, in the PVC areas, you're going to have a, um, uh, you're going to have migration of water. And what you've got to stop is that migration getting behind the area where the master seal is and into the concrete and what have you. So that interface is defined. That's something that um, typically very quickly would be a epoxy resin or epoxy mortar onto the concrete, a hydrophilic gel behind a uh, aluminium strip and then the PVC is welded to that aluminium strip. So that's like a, a PVC coated aluminium strip that is then bolted through the, um, the hydrophilic paste through the, the epoxy mortar into the concrete. And then the PVC strip is placed over the top of that. And then the master seal, typically at least 20 centimeters overlap is sufficient to create a bond and prevent any migration of water from the loose lay system with drainage into the double bonded composite shell lining. Um, anybody that requires that sort of detail, it is available and contact Jason um, on his uh, details that are up on the screen now. And through him, we will make available both access to the experts, um, but also the, the designer's handbook, which will cover the detail for that uh, rec particular requirement. Okay. Um, Nick, thanks very much. We're about to end because you're running out of time, but people have asked for your details and we will pass that on. Thank you very much for your time. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And you've got our details there. Please get in contact with us if you want to progress this or investigate these options further. Thank you very much. And we've had about, well, we've got 42 participants at the moment. I think we got up 50 odd earlier on. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you very much for sticking with us. Okay. Thank you, everyone.